And good evening to you kings and priests and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. I often say I greet the rest of you too, but I think they should have included every one. <clears throat> I want to get down at the root of a matter here tonight. There is a lot of work to be done for our Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to be involved in the work. But I'm going to talk about a pre-work here that is sorely needed in the Christian community. Amen. But it is one that is readily available and that is knowing that we shall be like him. I want to know the outcome of this enterprise in which I'm engaged. I want to know how it's going to end up. I'm not going to be willing to settle for a 2 or 3% fulfillment. I want to know what God has targeted for the people of God. And it is unquestionably this. That we shall be like him. Amen. Beloved. Now. <clears throat> we are the sons of God. And it does not yet appear. What we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear. We shall be like him. Amen. For we shall see him as he is. And every man. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Now there is in the word of God an underlying message. Something God wants to get across to people. In the word of God there is some philosophy. But philosophy is not the major strain of thought in scripture. There is in the word of God scholarship. But the purpose of the word of God is not to present a scholarly treatise. There's a lot of historical information in the scripture. But the word of God is not fundamentally a history book. And you cannot be saved by philosophy. Amen. And you cannot be saved by scholarship. And you cannot be saved by historicity. You have to have something living to save you. And God is a living God. I thank God for it. Amen. Now there are two main streams of theological thought as I see things. I have chosen to call them the Yabbat strain of theology and the Wino strain of theology. Everyone who represents Christ probably falls in one of these two theological thought patterns. The Yabbat thought pattern and the We Know thought pattern. The Yabbat thought pattern says, yes, the Word of God says that, but. And then they present their various philosophical views that neutralize the Word of God. The We Know pattern of theology says... We know that whatsoever things the law saith is set to them that are under the law, that every mouth might be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. We know that. That we know the other says, we know. Notice it doesn't say I know. It's saying we know. We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal soul to understand. We know that. We know it. We know the whole creation is groaning and travailing and painting together until now, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. We know that. So while people are a study in nature, nature is a study in us. Waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. See, we know this. Not we think this. Not this is our position. Now, this is how we have lined out our theological thought patterns. Here's the structure of it. It says, here is what we know this. We know it. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. We know it. It doesn't make any difference whether it looks like it or not. It doesn't make any difference whether high sounding philosophy says it or not. We know it is working together for our good. To all them that love God. And are called according to his purpose. We know it. We know that if the earthly house of our tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God eternal in the heavens, not made with hands.
and we know that there may be a lot of things we don't know. But we know that. We know that we are of God, the whole world, lie in the power of the wicked one. We know the Son of God has come and given us an understanding and on and on and on you can go. Christ Jesus' life is an economy of knowledge. Yes. Not head knowledge. Experiential knowledge. Yes. In Christ Jesus you come into an area of involvement with God. You come into an era of participation with deity where the human spirit and God's spirit are integrated. In fact, the word of God says he that's joined to the Lord is one spirit. No religion like this in the world where the people partake of their God, where the people partake of a divine nature, where the people dwell in God, God dwells in them. Where Christ dwells in them and they live in Christ. Where they walk in the spirit and the spirit dwells in them. There is no religion in the world that has something like that. It's an economy of spiritual knowledge. Now you notice he said, we know. This is family talk. It's not that some of us know. We know. It's built into the new nature. Is part of what you are when you're born again. Yes. Our job as ministers and teachers and preachers or whatever is to get the people of God up to speed so they know who they are. Right. David's not about to fight Goliath till he knows who he is and who God is. Right. We know him who has said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. We know. We don't know he said that. We know the one that said it. And it's all the difference yes. in the world. The covenant promise that God made through Jeremiah. And that he promised way back to Abraham. When he preached the gospel to Abraham in the embryo form. The covenant said they shall all know me. Amen. At last. God has a pension to be known. All the heathen gods don't want to be known. God wants to be known. His eyes are scanning to and fro upon the face of the whole earth to find a man whose heart is perfect toward him so he can show himself strong in their behalf. God's looking for someone that wants to preach like Brother Strauss said. Someone whose cause he can undergird if you can get on God's agenda, God will underwrite what you do. God wasn't on Paul's side and empowered him. Dionysius wouldn't have believed. But God was with him. These are things we know. Now I want to consider knowing what we shall we know we shall be like him. Now our text calls upon us to consider some things. Behold. That is, look at this, peruse this, examine this, don't let this pass you by, ponder it, contemplate it, meditate upon it. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. I want you to consider it and ponder it that God at great personal cost has brought you back. I will not let Ephraim go, God said. And so he pursued her, even though she waxed fat and kicked, as the scripture says. God has pursued us and openly demonstrated the pursuit in the death of his son. Behold, what manner of love! We've got a Savior that paid a price of enormity to save us. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. He laid aside the vestures of deity and left the prerogatives of deity and escrow and came to the world. And was crucified to weakness and cried out with strong cries and tears to God to save us. And in the end, the word of God says when the end comes, Oh, hallelujah, I love to think about it. Yes. 
When the end comes and he has subdued all enemies to himself, he shall deliver the kingdom back to God the Father. And he himself will be subject to the Father, that the Father might be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15, I can tell you that wasn't his state before he came to this world. Amen. That's a price he paid to save us. You look at what manner of love he has bestowed upon us. He has made it right and legal and just and proper for us to be called the sons of God. Amen. We are now the sons of God. We ought to be called sons of God. Now I've heard some learned disquisitions about what we ought to call the members of our church, you know, should we call them Christians, should we call them disciples, so, so, so. I never heard anyone pioneering calling them the sons of God, but I'd like to see that. Now we are the sons of God, and God has not forfeited one trait to make us sons. He has not pushed any part of his glorious character into the background. He has remained just and justifier of him that believes in Jesus. That's the manner of love. God can be devoted without apology to us. Amen. There is not a voice in heaven or in hell that can raise an objection. Who is he that condemns? The challenge goes out to the universe. that heaven stand forth. It's God that justifies. And if anyone wants to lay anything to the charge of God's elect, let him remember, it's Christ that died. Yeah. Yea, rather, who is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Talk about investment. Yes, that's right. uh, if you ever hesitate to give up anything for God, or you think God's asking too much of you, you go sit at the feet of Jesus and behold the manner of love that God's bestowed upon you, that you should be called the sons of God. <laughs> now I notice the effects of this. It says the world doesn't know us. Therefore, he says, the world doesn't know us. They don't know us. Well, actually, it's no wonder they don't. We're not of the world. That is, we that have been transformed. Or we that are being transformed and shaped into the image of Christ. The world doesn't know us, but we know them. We've been there. Yes. We know what it's like to be there. Yes. They don't know what it's like to be here. Sons of God, they don't know us. See, the grace of God has taught us what the law couldn't teach us. The law was weak through the flesh, the scripture says. It exacted more of us than we could give. It was too potent, too demanding, too unlike us. But now after the grace and mercy of God has appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. After that grace came, it taught us effectively to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, to say no. Now, incidentally, Satan cannot contend with no. When a person in Christ says, no, Satan can't contend with that. He's been diffused by our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly lust and live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's why the world doesn't know us. That's why it can't figure us out. Yes. We don't think like them. We don't see like them, hear like them. We have a different agenda, a different hope, a different purpose. That's the manner of love God hath bestowed upon us. We are the only religion in the world that can know whom we believe. Now you ask a person in a heathen religion, a Shintoist, do you know your God? No, they don't know their God. They know some things about their God, but they don't know their God. They're not intimate with their God. Their God never divulges his secret to them or shows them his covenant like our God. Are you noticing the text? It says, when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We know that when he shall appear. I mean, we're not going to appear till he appears. He's not going to unveil us till he unveils him. He is the priority. He is the author and the finisher.
finisher. He started it. He is the first. He is the alpha. He is the beginning. You're not going to be clearly revealed till he's clearly revealed. Yes. When he shall appear, then we'll be like him. We'll see him as he is. See, he's the first in everything. He's the first one to survive temptation. He survived it. And Satan had to leave him for a season. He's the first one to defeat the devil. In fact, the scripture says, through death he destroyed the devil. Yes. And he took principalities and powers that had governed the world and manipulated nations and he spoiled and plundered them at his weakest point yes. in the cross. At his weakest point, he plundered them. Can you imagine what he's doing now? Hallelujah. He repulsed them. He's the first to rise from the dead. He's the first to be glorified. He's the first to be exalted. And he's the first that will appear of God's new creation. No one's seen him really as he is fully now. When he walked with the disciples in his post-resurrection appearances, the miracle wasn't that he walked through the wall. The miracle was that they saw him at all. He was glorified of another order. One gospel writer said he appeared to them in another form. <laughs> Sort of adapting himself so that they could see him. But he is not going to adapt himself the next time he comes. That's right. When he appears, he snuck in the first time. He's not sneaking in the second. There isn't going to be any private showing. He's going to appear in all of his resplendent glory. Yes. And when he appears, we shall be loved. For we shall see him as he is. It's, it's what we see that's going to transform us. Just like it is in redemption. It's what you see that transforms you. If people aren't changed, it's because they haven't seen anything. When you see someone that's unchanged, you can just leave. No, you don't have to ask. You know, well, they haven't seen anything. Or they haven't seen very much. Or if you're pretty much status quo, holding your position, you're not being changed from glory to glory. It's because you haven't seen anything. You haven't perceived anything. In the kingdom of God is what you see that changes you. Amen. When Moses went up on Mount Sinai and spoke with God face to face and mouth to mouth, God said, I never spoke with anyone like with my servant Moses. Face to face and mouth to mouth. And he got so close to God, his countenance changed. And he had to put a veil over his face. In the presence of God, you can't get into God's presence and be unchanged. How much more when Jesus comes again? <clears throat> we shall see him as he is. It's going to be a consuming vision. Now when Jesus comes again, the gospel writer stated several places, Jesus uh, giving quotes from Jesus. One says, he shall come in all his glory and the glory of the Father, and the glory of the holy angels. That's, that's a lot of glory. And I can tell you the earth's not going to survive the appearance. The heavens and the earth will flee from before his face, and no place will be found for him. Everyone that has seen a representation of God to date, including the prophets and apostles and holy men of old, have only seen small representations, hinder parts and afterglows and trains that fill the temple. They have never seen him in his resplendent glory. But when Jesus comes back, the Father's going to pull off the robe from himself. And Jesus is going to take the robe off himself. And all the holy angels that have been accompanying the saints of God, unseen and undetected for centuries, are going to be unveiled. And we shall be changed in the glow of that glory Amen. to be like it. Now the secret to this is you have to now become compatible with the glory. <laughs> it isn't going to change people into the likeness of Christ whose heart is stony and who have remained unchanged and unaltered by the grace of God. 
What this life is all about is orientation time for glory. This is the time of preparation. This world isn't where it's at. It's the training ground. Yes. It's where you learn how to be a steward. It's where you learn how to handle a mini kingdom. It's where you learn how to listen. And where you learn how to follow. And where you learn how to speak. But when Jesus comes again, if you're ready, you won't be sitting in the back seat anymore, I'll tell you that. You'll not be the tail anymore, I'll tell you that. The saints will take over when they're in the full likeness of Christ. Now it says when he shall appear, and I like this thought of an all-consuming vision, which is the idea. <clears throat> to them that look for him as anxious, maybe today. <laughs> All my troubles are in. If Jesus were to come tonight, all the bad stuff would go and all the good stuff would come. I'm looking for it. I'm not looking for what they're going to do in Washington. I'm not looking for what they're going to do in some other quadrant of the world or some segment of society. See, the grace of God has taught us not only to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and God in the world, but to look yeah. for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, anticipating it and appearing. Yeah. Paul once said to Timothy, keep the commandment without spot until the appearing. Until the appearing. That's all. Just, just until the appearing. When he appears... No more struggle. No more obstacle. No more hindrance. See, now you've got to run through a troop and leap over a wall. You have to do that. You have to put on the gospel armor and repel the fiery darts and resist the devil. And you have to press the battle and stir up one another with exhortations. But when you're transformed into his likeness, ah, no more of that when Jesus comes again. Until they appearing, keep the commandment. And uh, Paul says by speaking about the appearing, not one of his appearings, the appearing, the, the consummate appearing. He said that the Lord, the righteous judge, is going to give me a crown of righteousness. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give unto me, and not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. Now, I'm very concerned that songs about the coming of Christ aren't in many hymnals. I'm concerned about this. I'm concerned that a lot of the courses I hear don't mention Christ's return. I'm concerned that in 160 churches I visited and ministered in in the last four years that I asked for a show of hands on who ever heard anything preached about the second coming of Christ. And unless somebody was over 50 years old, nobody raised their hands. And when there were some people over 50, very few of them raised their hands. We've got churches packed with people that have never heard of Jesus is coming again. Other than some cryptic little theological statement. They've never heard it proclaimed. They're not waiting for it. They're not looking for it. But I'm telling you, if you're not, it will not bring advantage to you. We love his appearing. You know, now, in this world, we are called upon to go through some times of stress and test. God just doesn't ask for a testimony. He puts you in the crucible. And he tries your faith. You say you believe? Huh? He puts it to the test that it might be found through his praise and glory at his appearing. That's right. You want your faith to come across strong then. Now this thing of when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Then we will appear as we really are. You remember in the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus looks as while he was praying. <laughs> while he was praying, the fashion of his countenance was altered. The skin of his face glowed. His garments were white and glistering like no fuller could whiten them. It was like a miniature resurrection. It was like his glory 
coming out. It, but it went away. It went away. But when Jesus comes back again, it's not going away. Amen. Right. It's not going away. Why is it that we are? Why is it that this statement is made? When he shall appear, we shall be like him, but we shall see him as he is. Why, why does he say it? Because this is God's predetermined purpose. He has marked out the Son of God as the pattern yes. for us all. He predestinated this. Before ever the world was created, he predestinated that we would be conformed to the image of his Son. He's not going back on it. If you abide in Christ and his words abide in you, you're going to end up like Christ. I can guarantee it. That's right. Predestinated purpose. To his disciples, he said one time, you didn't choose me. Now, I know people argue about this, but it'll all be settled in the judgment. I can tell you right now, when Jesus comes again, no one's going to say, hey, we chose you. You didn't choose me, Jesus, and I chose you. I chose you out of the world. You know, when they preached the gospel to the Gentiles, and they reported it to the early elders and apostles, they said they concluded God had taken a people out for his name. <laughs> God's in this. This is God's business and God's agenda. The only question is whether you are involved or not. Yes, that's right. It's whether you're participating or not. This agenda doesn't rise and fall and change and be altered. This is the way God's going to operate. He's going to bring the people in the Son to be like the Son, to sit with Him in His throne. Even as the Son overcame and sat with the Father in His throne, He's going to let them judge the world. He's going to let them judge angels. Daniel, the seventh chapter, said, The greatness of the kingdom under the whole heavens is going to be given to the saints of the Most High God. He can't trust it with them until they're like Christ. But when they are, they're going to receive it. See? God predestinated us in Christ. Chose us before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1, 4, and 5 says. And even in redemption. God's purpose is not just to get you out of sin. Now, I, I think I did think this for a while. I thought that really what this is all about was getting rid of my sin. Well, that, that does have to get done. I make no mistake about this, but that's not what it's all about. God's main purpose for Israel was not to get them out of Egypt. It was to get them into Canaan. That's why he brought them out of Egypt. Your sins will be remitted so you can come into a glorious inheritance that's laid up for you in hell that fades not away. In the meantime, you'll be kept by the power of God through faith for that inheritance. Yes. When he shall appear, Colossians 3, 4, I love this. He says, when he shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. Hmm. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the Lord saying, uh, at this present time, we are not going to resume the trial of Stephen before the Sanhedrin. And Judge Stephen will be presiding. When we appear with him, all the wrongs will be righted. John the Baptist said of the Lord Jesus, he was going to raise the valleys up and lower the mountains down. And he's going to make a straight path in the wilderness. Isaiah said he's going to raise up a highway in the wilderness, something where progress could be made. Now what I'm telling you is the progress is made to this appointed end. Yes. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. <clears throat> now, how do we know this? See, the word of God says we know this. We know this. This is not just academic knowledge, although that is involved. Yeah, someone might say, oh, we know this. We know this because the Bible says this. Well, that is true. But Job knew this before the Bible said this. That's right. See, that does not want wash. There's a certain spiritual intuition about this. That when people walk with God, even as rudimentary a walk as Job had, he knew in my flesh I shall see him and not for myself and not another. 
He knew it. He knew that God's target didn't end here, it ends there. Now, it's all been clarified in Christ, who's brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We know this. We know it. Uh, I'm going to see intuitively. Now, the Bible does say this, but even if the Bible didn't say it, everything about redemption points in that end. It makes you a stranger and a pilgrim in the world. You just, <laughs> you don't fit in anymore. And the world doesn't fit in you anymore either. But the, alas, the word of God has spoken about this. So we can put our faith. See, faith has to have something solid to anchor onto. And so the word of God has stated, we shall be. You can count on this. You can count on this. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You may see a hundred things in you now that's unlike him, but they won't be there then. We shall be like him. I don't like being unlike him in any way now. I don't. And I will wage relentless war against that unlikeness. But I'm looking forward to when I don't have to do that anymore. I'll be like it in every way. Now we know this because actually the work's already underway. We're already involved in the process. We know we should be like it. Because there's already some progress has been made. Amen. The word of God says we are being changed from glory to glory, from one stage of glory to another, even as by the Spirit of our God. The Holy Spirit of God. I don't know why so many people in our movement have elected to argue about the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I do know, but I'm trying to be polite. <laughs> I want God's Holy Spirit. Yeah. I don't want anybody telling me that the Holy Spirit's not for me. I don't want to hear it. Because he's the changer. Mm -hmm. He's changes. I have to have your consent. I understand he has to have your consent, but you can be willing in the day of his power, as that psalmist said. That's right. We are being changed. Well, I can prove to you that already you think like God already. Not fully, I understand that. But it's not over yet. When Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. <laughs> For the first time in four centuries, the heavens reverberated with the voice of God. Now the people staying on the shore didn't know the significance of the moment. Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove and, and settled right down on Christ. God said this. This is my this is it. This is my beloved son <laughs> in whom I'm well pleased. Let me tell you something. I am too. Mm -hmm. I'm already thinking like God in that respect. Mm -hmm. There was a time I didn't think like that. But I do now. I'm well pleased in Christ. Mm -hmm. Already shaping up to be like Christ. Instead of the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll eat butter and honey. The prophet said, you know, he'll choose the good and refuse the evil. He'll know how to do that. I haven't mastered it, but I've learned. There's some things I've learned to refuse. And there's some other things I've learned to embrace. Mm -hmm. Shaping up, see, bit. By bit. Word of God. Jesus, you know, he lived by every word of God. He said, I can't say anything except what the Father tells me to say. I can't do anything except what the Father tells me to do. He relied upon the Father, and I'm beginning to experience that. Of relying upon the Father. He shaping up to be like the Son. The Son looked out on the multitudes. The disciples, they looked out and they saw a bunch of Samaritans. Hey, let's call some fire down. Let's, let's have the power of Elijah here. Would you like us to do that, Lord? I've often wondered what they would have done if he just said, well, go ahead, fellas, and call some down. But instead of Jesus, when he saw the multitudes, he didn't see them as competitors. He didn't see them as stupid people. He saw them as sheep going astray without a shepherd. Amen. 
But sometimes when you walk close with Christ, people begin to look different. Yeah. And the people you were intolerant with and couldn't abide, suddenly you see them, you see them differently. Why? <laughs> they don't have a leader. They don't have a captain. They're wandering, a victim of the devil who is robbing and killing and destroying them. What is that? You're being conformed to the image of his son. Jesus himself is pictured in scripture as sitting on a cloud with a sickle waiting for the harvest. He's waiting. He's anticipating. In fact, if I understand in the word of God that Jesus has foregone the knowledge of that day voluntarily to fellowship with us and the anticipation of it, he's anxious to receive us to himself. He's already told us that in the last day he's going to stand, he's going to stand there before the Father and say, Father, behold, I am the children that you've given me. Here, we're all there. <laughs> of all that you gave me, I lost none. <laughs> there they are. Hey, the Father gave you to Jesus. He said, all the Father gives me will come to me. Amen. And he that comes to me, I'll in no wise cast out. Oh, the Savior. We're being shaped up into his image. You know, the uh, 2 Corinthians puts a lot about this in the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says, God, who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the glory of the knowledge of God in the face of Christ Jesus. So that as you become an expert in studying Christ and perusing Christ and examining Christ, it actually transforms you. You see God's glory in the person of Jesus Christ. And it transforms you and changes you now. See, that's how we know we're going to be like him because we're headed in that direction now, in fact, <laughs> we've been wrought, we've been made by God to be completely like Christ. There in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul breaks out of the great interlude of praise. He says, we know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle were destroyed, we have a building of God and a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. He said, while we're in this body, we grow, be burdened. It's a burden. It's a burden. <laughs> Every beauty pageant ought to have a sign up over it said the body is a burden. <laughs> this is a display of vile bodies. Well, the other versions toned it down a little bit. It said body humiliation. It's a burden. We burden. We're burdened. Growing being burdened. We don't want to be unclothed. We don't want to, we don't want to be without a body. We want to be clothed with our house with this one, which is from heaven. It's there for us now. Second Corinthians 5, 5, speaking of that resurrection body, what he's talking about. He says, he that hath wrought us for the self-same thing is God. God made you to be like Christ. Fully like him. Now, there's a motivating power to this knowledge. It's not knowledge like knowledge of George Washington or knowledge of mathematics. It's not that kind of knowledge. It's possible to get a, a book about swimming and learn all about swimming, all the proper moves and all this sort of thing, how to keep your feet, and, and drown because you didn't really know it. <laughs> now, what, what happens in Christ is you get into the water where you know and learn to be like Christ. Every man that has this hope, this hope of being like Christ, this longing to be like Christ, this longing sometimes makes you say, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this man? I thank God! <laughs> it's on the way, folks. The answer's on the way. With my mind, I myself serve the law of God, even though with the flesh, the law of sin. I'm not going to be this way always. I have this hope. It's a dominating hope. When it says every man that has this hope in him, it doesn't mean a casual hope. It means a dominating hope. 
What does it do? What impact does it have? He purifies himself, even as he is pure. His first assignment is marshal that body of yours, marshal your resources, bring them into subjection. We're just like Israel coming into Canaan. God said the whole land's yours, enter in. When they got there, the Canaanite was in the land. I had the inhabitants in it already. People living there already. They had to drive them out. When you were born again, and you come up out of the waters of baptism, and you rose to walk in a new life, there were some foreigners in your land. Yeah. First thing you knew, some things popped up you thought wouldn't. There they were. Your job is drive them out. Subjugate them. Crucify the flesh with its affections and lusts. Refuse to let them dominate. How are you going to do that? Not by someone telling me you have to do it. Now I used to do this. I didn't know any better. I do now, so I quit doing it. I used to be merciless with God's people. But the world beat them up when they come to church, and I beat them up. And I told them what they ought to do, and told them what they ought to be. And you ought to do this, and you ought to you know almost every sermon I've heard since I have arrived in the holy state of Missouri, almost every sermon I have heard about holiness has completely excluded grace and the work of God. And if you don't believe it, you find some tape, archive, find it somewhere. Go to a college, go to a library, find it. And you look up at an index and find a sermon on holiness and I can guarantee you, you will, it will be hard to find one that mentions this hope being in them or grace being in them or he that's in them being greater than he that's in the world. Amen. You cannot legislate this kind of holiness. That's right. It comes because of a preference for being like Christ. Every man that has this hope in him Purifies himself. Purifies himself. I like what 2 Corinthians 7 1 says. Wherefore, dearly beloved, having such promises, the promises was were just before he said, to Come out from among them, touch not the unclean thing. I'll receive you. You'll be my sons and daughters. Heaven, dearly beloved, promises such as that, let's cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of flesh and spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let's get the flesh out of the church. Let's get it out of the singing. Let's get it out of the praying, out of the preaching. Let's get it out. Amen. Right. How are you going to do that? You're going to have to steer people up to the fact in a little while. <laughs> and he that shall come will come and will not dare. Pretty soon the king shall appear. And when he appears, we shall also appear with him in glory. 1 John 2, 28 says, There's no need for you to be ashamed before him at his coming. When Jesus comes again, I don't want to have to hang my head in shame because I haven't fought a good fight or run a good race or because I let some person discourage me. I want to lift up my head and say, Behold my King. This is who we've waited for. He will come and save us. And if you're looking when he comes, you'll be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. God's going to blow his trumpet. If there was, I'm going to, this is going to sound kind of bad, but I'm going to say it. If there was no other reason not to believe you shouldn't have an instrument, I don't want to have to be woke up by something I thought was a sin. <laughs> Change. The anticipation of this is a powerful motivation. So in the hope of it, and it works. This works. This is God's motivation. He says, let me tell you what I'm going to do. <laughs> let me tell you what I'm going to do. One time God took the prophet Ezekiel. 
It was said of Ezekiel, he saw visions of God. He took Ezekiel, he took him down to a valley of dry bones. There were very many, very dry. He caused them to pass by, pass by, look them over. He said, lo, they were very many. And they were very dry. God said, son of man, can these bones live? Can they? Amen. Ezekiel said, you know. He said, I want you to preach to these bones. Now we would tell them something. What are you going to tell them, Ezekiel? Now when Ezekiel was from some of the circles I've been in, he'd have upbraided the bones for being dry. He had rebuked them for being in the valley in the first place. He said, who you been hanging around with? You had no business being all dissembled and dry. He had laid them low. Another guy would have philosophized about it. Well, I don't know. There's various degrees of dryness. Maybe we can do a little preliminary work and gather them together ourselves a little bit. The message Ezekiel preached is startling. I, I've talked about this often, but I, it's still challenges my mind. All Ezekiel told those bones was what God was going to do. That is all he told. He said, oh ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. He said, I'm going to gather you together. I'm going to put flesh and sinews and skin on you. I'm going to Bring you into your land. I am going to put my spirit in you. I am going to make you live. That's all he told. That's all. That's all he told. What he was going to do. But as he prophesied. There was a noise in the valley. And the bones. <laughs> began to break loose. From the dominion of death. And suddenly they were all assembled together. And became carcasses you know. That, that, that's where the restoration is at now. <laughs> we got the carcass. What do we do now? He said, ah, we got to bring the spirit into this. And he preached to the spirit. said, oh, <laughs> spirit, come and breathe upon these. I don't miss this. Slain. These people have been slain. They were victims. The Holy Spirit stood them up in an exceeding great army. Now here's what I'm saying. Our people sorely need to hear what God is going to do when Jesus comes again. They sorely need to hear what God is making out of his people. They need to hear it. They need to have someone say it. To declare it. That we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And it's just going to be a little while, just a little while, that's all. And he's going to come. And when he comes, your handicaps will go in a twinkling of an eye. When he shall appear, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is.